I am a typical 17th century person, and I'd like to tell you today about a terrible war that divided and almost destroyed our country that started in the year 1642. This war has gone by many names. In my time, it was called the War of the Three Kingdoms. It was also called the English Civil War and the English Civil Wars. Nowadays, it's called the British Civil Wars. It's very confusing. But what is a civil war? Do you know? Take a few moments in your class to discuss it and answer the question, what is a civil war? See you shortly. Welcome back. Hopefully now you all know what a civil war is. But just in case you don't, a civil war is when people from the same country fight against each other. Is that anything like the answer you gave? I thought so. Before I tell you about who fought who and who won and who lost and why, I think it's important that you understand how people in the 17th century think. Because the way we think is very, very different from the way you think. For example, I believe that by using the power of science, you can turn metal into gold. I believe that to cure a case of plague, you just need to sniff some sweet-smelling herbs. And I also believe that most old people who own cats are witches. You see what I mean? We, in the 17th century, think very differently from you strange and unusual people in the future. And the way we think affected how our country was ruled and why we went to war with each other. It's all very complicated. And if I tried to explain it to you using only words, it would get very confusing very fast. And so we are going to build what I like to call the 17th century Pyramid, Pyramid of, of power. power. To start with, I need 10 volunteers to form a line, sit on the floor at the front of the class. I'll give you a few moments to do this. Excellent. Thank you for volunteering. Now, you ten people in a line on the floor are the commoners of England, Scotland, Ireland and Wales. You're the normal people who do normal jobs in the kingdom, like farming the land or being a servant. There are millions of you and nobody cares what you think. Sorry about that. Now, I need eight more volunteers to form a line behind the commoners. Kneel down so that you are only slightly above them. Done that? Good. Now, you people make more money and have better jobs than the commoners. You are the merchants, the shopkeepers, the people who sell things. You are the middle classes. And you consider yourself to be more important than the commoners. Now, I want four more volunteers to sit on seats behind and above the middle classes and the commoners. Off you go. Now, you four people are the government or parliament. You are the people who make the laws and run the country. You are also very rich. Parliament is made of rich and powerful men. Sorry, no women. Who own lots of land and are mostly sirs and lords. Parliament gets to tell the middle class people and the commoners what to do. Sounds good, doesn't it? But there is someone above even you lot, somebody who gets to tell Parliament, the middle classes and the commoners what to do. Who do you think it is? Let me give you a clue. That person sits on a chair like this. It's the king. The king could tell Parliament, the middle classes and the commoners what to do. Now, I need somebody who likes bossing people around and telling them what to do to be the king. 
the volunteer needs to put the king costume on in your classroom and stand behind parliament, middle classes and the commoners. Off you go. Excellent. The pyramid of power is almost complete. But it's not completely complete, because there is one person, and one person only, who could tell the king what to do. Who, or what, do you think that could be? I'll give you a few moments to think about it. I'm here if you need me. Right, that's enough time. Here's the answer. The only person who could tell the king what to do was God himself. All kings and queens believed that God had put them on the throne and it was only God that could remove them. He might remove them by having them killed in battle or perhaps having them die of some sudden, awful, dreadful disease. Now, I'm not going to ask for a volunteer to be God. We will just imagine him up in the heavens. God is at the top of the pyramid of power. God looks down at the king, the king looks down at parliament, and parliament makes laws which tell the common people and the middle class people what to do. This is the pyramid of power, and it should look something like this. Pyramid of power doesn't look quite right. Something's wrong. I've got it. Not enough commoners. The rest of you in the class who aren't in the pyramid of power go and sit on the floor with all the commoners. That's better. Far more common. Oh, I could smell you all from here. This is the way it's been for hundreds and hundreds, possibly thousands of years. But things get a little bit complicated in the 17th century. Are you ready for something a little bit more complicated? I thought so. In the 17th century, things change. The king has still got lots of power and he's still very rich. He can have someone's head chopped off if he wants to. He can declare war on another country, if he wants to, but he can't do everything that he wants to do, especially when it comes to Parliament. What do I mean? Well, I could tell you, but I think it would be better coming from the King himself. Hello, lowly subjects. I am King Charles I. I've been King of England, Scotland and Ireland since 1625, and I'm not happy. Why? Because of my Parliament. Let me tell you how things used to be between a king and his parliament. Only a king can open parliament, and if the king wants parliament to open, all he has to do is say so, and parliament turn up and go to work. And if parliament are annoying the king for some reason, like trying to make laws he doesn't agree with, he can shut them down and send them home, just like that. Watch. You. Yes, you people in the pyramid of power, you four sitting on seats, by the power vested in me as your king, I shut you down, get off your lazy backsides and go back to your original seats. And as for the rest of you, you commoners and middle class people, stop being so lazy. Get up, go back to your seats as well. Clear off. And once I'm convinced the Parliament have learnt their lesson and will do what I want them to do, I open Parliament again and it's back to work. Come on, Parliament. Come on, everybody else. Return to your positions in the Pyramid of Power. Now, that's how things were, that's how things ought to be, but things have changed. These days, Parliament have a little bit of power over me and can, sort of, tell me what to do. And it really gets up my nose. Thank you, Your Majesty. 
Now, I want to introduce you to a Member of Parliament who will tell you what Parliament's not-so-secret power was. My name is John Pym, and I am a Member of Parliament. The King seems to think he can do what he likes, but he can't. While it's right that the King is very rich and very powerful, he's not that rich. He doesn't own all the money in the kingdom. And if the king wants some extra money for things that even he can't afford, like fighting a war, the law says that he has to ask Parliament for it first. And the best bit is, we can say no to the king, and he can't do anything about it. Can you, Your Majesty? Well, you say I can't do anything, but I can do one thing. I can shut you down! Go on, Parliament. Go on, everybody else. Back to your original places. Clear off. I'm fed up with you. And come back again. Return to your places in the Pyramid of Power. And that's what it was like at the beginning of Charles I's reign. The king would need money for something, usually a war, and Parliament tended to say no. And the reason they said no was... Thank you, I'll explain this bit. The reason that we said no to the king was that we wanted him to give some of his power to Parliament. We would happily have given him money for his bishops' wars if only he gives some of his power to us. That sounds fair, doesn't it? The king didn't think so. In fact, the king got so frustrated that... Thank you, I'll explain this bit. Eventually, I got so fed up with Parliament that I decided to shut them down and not open them again for... Well, you tell me. Go on, raise your hands, tell your teacher. I didn't open Parliament again for 11 years. Did you hear that? 11 years! Go on, Parliament. Parliament is closed. Go on, clear off, Parliament. Yes, and, and all you commoners and middle-class people, go back where you came from. Now, if only I could get my hands on all of that money that Parliament used to give me. Mm. So, King Charles I began what we now call his period of personal rule, where he tried to rule the country without his Parliament for 11 years. During this time, the King still needed money. He couldn't run the country on his own without money. Where could he get some money from? Have a talk amongst yourselves and come up with some ideas about where the king got money. The king forced rich people to lend him money. Money that he was probably never going to pay back. That was one way the king got money. Another way was to get money from his people using taxes. The king had a favourite tax called ship tax. Ship tax was money you had to pay to repair and build ships, to protect you from pirates and foreign invaders if you lived by the seaside. The people hadn't paid ship tax for years, but the king made them start paying it again. The king made everybody pay ship tax, whether you lived by the sea or not. So here's a question for you. Put your hand up if you live by the sea. Put your hand up if you don't live by the sea. Whether you lived by the sea or not, you had to pay ship tax. Does that sound fair? Should the people who live at the seaside only pay ship tax, or should everybody pay for it? It's an interesting question, isn't it? And what would happen if you didn't pay your ship tax? Have a moment and talk about it. This is what might happen if you didn't pay ship tax. You might get thrown in jail. Even worse, do you know that King Charles isn't using your hard-earned money on repairing ships? Isn't that right, Your Majesty? Might be. What did you spend that money on, Your Majesty? 
Uh, do I have to say? Yes, Your Majesty. I spent it on nice, expensive paintings, like this. Really? You didn't spend it on ships? Uh, no, but let me explain. I, I needed to keep up with the kings of France and Spain, who made themselves look mighty and kingly and strong with expensive art. You see, the people need to see that their king is a magnificent king. How do you think the people felt about how the king was spending all this money? Obviously, there were a lot of people who felt this was outrageous. People like me. People like him. But, and this is very important, there were also a lot of people who felt that because God had put the king on the throne, he could do what he liked with his money, and that was perfectly fine. The country was divided over the issue. And this is where Charles I does something to complicate matters even more. Are you ready for something more complicated? Good. Now that the king didn't have to deal with Parliament anymore, he could sort out the church in his country without Parliament interfering. Before I tell you what he did, let me first explain how religion worked in 17th century England. In the 17th century, everybody was some form of Christian. Being a Catholic was illegal. Being a Catholic was against the law. Except the king's French wife, Queen Henrietta Maria, Bonjour. was a Catholic. But the king protected her, which annoyed a lot of people. But that still left lots of other types of Christians who all disagreed with each other, particularly on the topic of God, the king, and who should have most power. Now, I'm going to show you two types of Christians who disagreed with each other particularly harshly. For this, I'm going to need two volunteers that don't mind dressing up. In your classroom, you will find two more costumes. Take a few moments to put them on. If you dressed up and you looked like this... You will be called an Armenian or a member of the Church of England. We in the Church of England believe that God should be worshipped in fancy churches with stained glass windows and statues and sweet-smelling incense like this one. We believe that the Church should be led by archbishops who believe that God has placed the King on the throne to rule the Church with archbishops and bishops as second and third in command. I am Archbishop Lord. I am the King's favourite bishop. And if you dressed up and you looked like this? You are called a Puritan. We Puritans are very strict and moral and will become famous in the 17th century for banning Christmas and football and theatre. We believe worshipping God should be simple. We do not like the Church of England with their fancy church buildings and stained glass windows and statues and sweet smelling incense. We would secretly like to break all of these windows and smash all of these statues to pieces. We don't believe the church should be led by archbishops in their fancy clothes who believe that the king is in charge of the church. We believe the church should be led by the people. I am William Prim. I am the king's least favourite Puritan. Unfortunately for the Puritans, King Charles I wanted everybody to worship God the same way he did. He put his best bishop on the case, Archbishop William Lord. And William Lord had some gruesome ways of dealing with Puritans who liked to use this contraption. What do you think this might be? Put your hand up and tell your teacher. It's a printing press. You can make hundreds or thousands of books or smaller books called pamphlets using this contraption. Puritans, like Mr. Prynne, liked to write pamphlets criticising the king's bishops, in particular Archbishop Lord. Isn't that right, Mr. Prynne? Yes, it is. Which made Archbishop Lord really angry, didn't it? It certainly did. In fact, I was so angry, I had William Prynne and three of his pamphlet-writing, trouble-making Puritan friends arrested and terribly, terribly punished. 
And what was this terrible, terrible punishment? I had my ears chopped off. Ah! He had your ears chopped off? I I'm sorry, I can't hear you. I've, I've had my ears chopped off. Oops. But that's not the worst thing that Archbishop Lord did. In the year 1639, Archbishop Lord and King Charles I made a very foolish mistake. They tried to make the Scottish church, called the Kirk, worship God exactly the same as the English Anglican church. Big mistake! You see, nearly the whole of Scotland was Puritan, except we call Scottish Puritans Presbyterians. And the Puritans, sorry, Presbyterians, were particularly tough and didn't like the king telling them how to worship God. Isn't that right, Jenny? Aye, it's true. We Scots don't like being told what to do, especially by English kings and their pesky bishops. Archbishop Lord tried to insist that the Scottish worship God by reading from the Church of England prayer book. It didn't go well, did it, Jenny? No, it did not. And when the King's prayer book was read out in my church, I picked up the stool I was sitting on and I threw it at the preacher. It started a massive riot in my church. And then there were riots across the whole of Scotland. Do you think King Charles was happy about the Scots beating up his vicars and telling him what to do? No, I was furious. So I decided to fight a war with these Scottish Puritans called the Bishop's Wars. But as we were all aware, fighting a war is a very expensive business. I needed money. So, so, so who did I know that could help me raise enough money to fight the Bishop's Wars? A bunch of people I hadn't spoken to in 11 years. Yes, you've guessed it, Parliament. Come back, Parliament. Come back, everybody else. Get off your lazy backsides and return to your positions in the pyramid of power. All is forgiven. So, on the 13th of April, 1640, after 11 years of not doing anything, Parliament is once again open. The Puritans in Parliament, which made up just over half, were furious, but they saw an opportunity. We will agree to give the king the money he needs for his bishop's wars, but only if he listens to our complaints about him. How do you think the king feels about this? No, I was furious and very, very angry. Go on, Parliament, I close you down. Get off your seats, off your knees and off your backsides and go back to where you came from. And so the King shuts down Parliament after only a month of being open. He sends a cheap, poorly equipped army into Scotland and the Scots defeat the English. <coughs> King Charles sends an even cheaper, more poorly equipped army into Scotland and the Scots defeat the English again. <coughs> but this time it's even worse. This time, the Scots defeat the English, but then they actually invade England. They occupy the city of Newcastle, and they won't go until the English pay them £50,000. £50,000! That's about £30 million in modern money. The king didn't have this kind of money. Who could help the king raise £50,000 quickly to pay the Scots to go away? Do you know? Quickly, put your hands up and tell your teacher. It's Parliament! The King had to recall Parliament. Again. Oh, do I have to? Yes, Your Majesty, you do. Oh, right then, Parliament, come back. All is forgiven. I really mean it this time. Come on, everybody else, return to your positions in the Pyramid of Power. On the 22nd of November, in the year 1641, Parliament was open for business. But this time, Parliament was ready for the King. 
They agreed to give him the money he needed to pay the Scots to go away, but only if he really closely and very carefully listened to their complaints against him and agreed to give Parliament more power. The list of complaints was called the Grand Remonstrance. The Puritans in Parliament raised 204 complaints against the King. 204 complaints? Yes, 204 complaints. Here's just the top three. One, the King must sack all of his bishops. Two, the King must get rid of all of his most troublemaking advisers. Three, Parliament must have a say in him who the King chooses to advise him in the future. And how did you feel about this, Your Majesty? I wasn't happy about it, but I pretended to go along with their demands until eventually I got fed up and decided that I'd had enough of Parliament. And what did you do? Close Parliament down again? Oh no, not this time. What I did was so much better than that. Yeah, I'll tell you what he did. He turned up with a bunch of soldiers and tried to arrest five particularly troublesome Puritan members of Parliament. I was one of them. Ah yes, I remember it well. I walked into the House of Commons and addressed the Speaker of the House and said, Where are they? Yes, and the Speaker of the House of Commons said, My eyes and ears work as this House directs them. Hmm, that's a bit wordy. What did he mean? Well, he meant he wasn't going to tell the King where the troublemakers were. And what did you do, Your Majesty? Well, things weren't going according to plan, and the mood in the room was getting very ugly, so I decided to get out of there as quickly as possible. And then I left London. At this point in the story, neither the supporters of the King nor the supporters of Parliament could trust each other. The King could not command Parliament anymore. It was all over. King and Parliament were almost at war. Both sides began to form armies and the country was divided into two. Do you remember the Pyramid of Power? God was in heaven, the King was in charge and Parliament was under his control. But now the world has turned upside down and the pyramid of power has broken. The king is forced to leave his London palace and start a new capital city in Oxford. If you supported the king, you were called a cavalier. And if you supported parliament, you were called a roundhead. Let's split the pyramid of power down the middle. Half of you go with the king and his bishop and stand on one side of the classroom. You are the cavaliers. The other half of you go with your Puritan and stand on the opposite side of the classroom. You are the roundheads. I'll give you a few moments to do this. See you swiftly. Right. Now you are divided into two armies, one cavalier, one roundhead. You're going to help me tell the story of the fighting during the Civil War. On the 22nd of August in the year 1642, King Charles I raised an enormous flag outside Nottingham Castle. In doing so, he declared war on Parliament. Hello, King. Yes, yes, you in there, in the classroom. I need you, if you have one, to go and pick up a flag or a big standard and wave it about. Now, let's talk about the first big battle. To begin with, both sides were evenly matched, with equally good soldiers on both sides. Both armies in the classroom take one step towards each other. On the 25th of October 1642, the Cavaliers and the Roundheads fought a battle in a place called Edge Hill. Who do you think won? Put your hand up if you think it was your side. Well, this might surprise you, because it was actually a draw. Both sides killed and wounded almost exactly the same amount of men, and both sides claimed they had won, but it was a draw. Roundheads and Cavaliers take one step towards each other.
In the year of 1643, the Cavaliers did incredibly well. They won some incredible battles in the north of England, Wales, and the southwest of England. Cavaliers take two steps forward. Roundheads take two steps backwards. But then, in 1644, the Roundheads got some help from Scotland. Ah! Yes, I said Scotland. And all those Presbyterians who were furious with the King, but had stayed out of the war up until now, joined forces with Parliament to fight against him. Roundheads take one step forward, Cavaliers take one step backwards. On the 2nd of July, 1644, the English and Scottish Roundheads fought a battle against the Cavaliers in a place in Yorkshire called Marston Moor. It was the biggest battle ever to be fought on English soil. Who do you think won? Go on, if you think it was your side, put your hand up now. It was the Roundheads. And in the space of two hours, the Scottish Presbyterians and the English Roundheads totally, absolutely and categorically slaughtered the Cavaliers. And do you know who was there, fighting on the side of the Roundheads, fighting better than anybody else on the battlefield? It was the most famous Roundhead of all. Do you know who I mean? I haven't mentioned his name yet. Put your hands up if you know the answer. Oliver Cromwell, that's who. And it's Oliver Cromwell who, perhaps more than any other roundhead, was responsible for winning the Battle of Marston Moor for Parliament. Now, you roundheads take two steps forward. Cavaliers take two steps backwards. This should really have been the end for the Cavaliers. And if Oliver Cromwell had been in charge, it probably would have been. But he wasn't. Not yet. But shortly after the Battle of Marston Moor, the head of the Roundhead Army was sacked. And Cromwell and his best mate, Sir Thomas Fairfax, were put in charge. Fairfax and Cromwell devised a new type of Roundhead Army called the New Model Army. And it was the new model army that met the King's army at the Battle of Naseby on June the 14th, 1645. The Cavaliers had 7,000 soldiers, but the Roundheads had 14,000 soldiers. Who do you think won? Put your hand up if you think it was your side. It was the Roundheads. The Roundheads so completely and comprehensively battered the Cavaliers that the King couldn't put together another army. Roundheads take three steps forward. Cavaliers take three steps backwards. Even though he didn't have an army, the King carried on fighting. Many of his followers surrendered. Some changed sides and became roundheads. And some ran away and left the country. But some, like the people here in Newark, continued to fight. Why would they continue to fight when they knew that they couldn't win? Why is it, Your Majesty? Because of the pyramid of power, of course. Because God has placed me on the throne and is on my side. And if God is on my side, how can I possibly lose? I'll tell you why, because God is on the side of the Puritans. Don't forget Scotland. God's on our side as well. So what do you think happened? Did the king get his miracle? Did he win the war? Perhaps not. The king became a prisoner of the Scots. The Scots took him to Newcastle and sold him to the English a few months later. The town of Newark surrendered on the 8th of May 1646 two days after the king had been taken prisoner. It was one of the last towns to give in. 
The war was over. Well done, Roundheads. But what happened to the King? Two and a half years later, Parliament put me on trial for the crime of treason. On the 30th of January, 1649, they sentenced me to death and chopped off my head. When my head was chopped off, it was said that the enormous crowd that had gathered to see me die let out a collective gasp of shock as the executioner's axe fell. The king is dead. Parliament rules the country. The pyramid of power has been broken. But things will not remain that way for long. In a few years, Cromwell will become more and more powerful and will eventually rule the country. But he will die and the king's son, Charles II, will return and sit on his father's throne. So perhaps King Charles I was right after all. Perhaps God was on his side. But that's another story entirely. <laughs> <laughs>